Welcome. 20 years ago, I organised a conference on behalf of the Scottish Local History Forum on the life of Sir John Sinclair of Albster, who established the Board of Agriculture and Internal Improvement in 1793. He challenged people to experiment with husbandry, and he had a fierce determination with which he went about his main objective, the gathering of useful information. He inspired Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles Darwin, who dedicated his scientific paper on the philosophy of agriculture and gardening to Sir John in 1800, while men from the parish of Preston Kirk corresponded with Sinclair on his challenges and praised his initiative. It is a beautiful day in the graveyard of Preston Kirk in East Linton. I am visiting it to reflect on the lives of five men from the parish who now lie here in peace. Four of them have memorial stones. Some are difficult to read. This gravestone on the left records the life of a Robert Brown. At one time he lived at Drylaw Hill to the northwest of where he now lies. Nearby is the memorial stone for George Rennie, the owner of Fantasy Estate to the south of the graveyard. John Sheriff is mentioned on this family gravestone near the entrance to the Kirk. He accompanied George Rennie and Robert Brown on a trip to the West Riding of Yorkshire in 1793 and also undertook a survey of farming practice in the Orkney and Shetland Islands. The fourth man, Sir George Buckenhebburn, does not have a gravestone. When he rebuilt the Kirk in 1770, the old east-facing altar to the Hebburns was converted to create a family vault. The last of the men, of the five men, was Andrew Meikle, who died at the age of 92. His gravestone tells visitors of his achievements as an inventor and civil engineer. We can find other evidence of people in this graveyard now scheduled by Historic Environment Scotland. Sir George Buckenhebburn and John Sheriff both responded to requests by the new Royal Caledonian Horticultural Society to share their experiences by letters. Some were published and written shortly before the Cali was established in December 1809. John Hay, a noted garden architect and designer of a number of local walled gardens, has a link with this iron gravestone in memory of his father. He provided the design for the Cali's experimental wall garden no part of the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. In addition to the local surveyors, there was a network of local head gardeners, as shown in this slide. James Kirk was one of the first corresponding members in the new Caledonian Horticultural Society formed in 1809, a James Gibb from Fantasy, and a David Ford from Tinningham joined in 1810. James Kirk was factor at Smeaton when he died in 1850. A John Gibb was a tenant farmer on George Rennie's estate and wrote about the problems of managing gooseberry pests. This is a photo of Gibb's field which became a noted source of strawberries for the market. His gravestone is difficult to read.
This is a magnificent memorial stone to James to James Kirk. He would have created the lake and planted the trees around it before 1830. His wife was related to a noted firm of masons, which partly explains why it is of such a stunning design for the gardener. This is a caricature of Sinclair who lived in Edinburgh when not in London or up in Thurso. Amazing to think of the distances this man travelled. In 2010, I published an article in the Transactions of the East Lothian Antiquarian Society with the title All the President's Men. The main focus was on Sir John Sinclair, on Sir John Sinclair of Ulster, near Thurso. In 1793, Sinclair had rescued the government and the country from a financial disaster. It was at the start of the Napoleonic War. The Prime Minister, William Pitt, was full of gratitude and readily agreed to Sinclair's request to establish a Board of Agriculture and Internal Improvement. According to his biographer, the late Professor Rosalind Mitchison, Sinclair's main interest was in economic development, described by Sinclair as the promotion of improvement. He lost no time in setting up the new board, which had its first meeting in August 1793. He had already appointed men to undertake surveys of agricultural practice in every county in the UK. He was operating in the belief that his actions would be agreed in order to establish the need and means of improvement in what he described as husbandry. He was later questioned whether he had that authority. Robert Brown praised the establishment of the board and that surveys would enable a body of facts to be accumulated. He supported the proposed practice for original reports to be circulated before being reprinted in a more perfect state. It would allow additional information from intelligent men in the district being surveyed before being reprinted in a more perfect state. In 1796, Sinclair sent a questionnaire to farmers, nurserymen and gardeners scattered throughout the kingdom. He wanted the experience of practical men that would stand the test of discussion and experiment about agents that are necessary to vegetation and those that were destructive. One of the men who responded was Sir George Buckenhebburn, Laird of Smeatonhebburn, which he inherited from his deceased mother's brother in 1764. His general review of the agriculture of East Lothian with observations on the means of improvement was published in 1794. This was the first local report submitted to Sir John Sinclair. In 1797, Sinclair's annual re-election as president of the board was lost by one vote. Sir Joseph Banks had organised a vote against him, and Sinclair's power to make things happen were over for a few years. All surveys had been suspended in May 1798. The expenses for 1793 West Riding Survey were still to be paid, and Brown was told that the boards could not enter into any contract with him for any further examination of Derbyshire. In addition, the reprinting of the report on the West Riding had to be approved before any work goes into the world under the sanction of the board. The aspiration of Sinclair and Robert Brown were not shared by the new board.
Meanwhile, the minutes of the Hemeters of Fess and Kirk disclose a major crisis in the parish. On the 26th December 1799, led by Sir George, they decided to form a committee to provide oatmeal for the widows, single women, aged persons and those in distress at a reduced rate. The parish records show that 128 people were still getting help on the 15th of December 1800. On the 9th of April 1800, Robert Brown wrote to the Board of Agriculture on the need for action to grow better crops throughout the country, chiefly through more experimentation and better knowledge of husbandry. There was also a dispute about the practice of enclosure of land for agricultural improvement. Evidence of this can be found in the introduction to the second edition of the West Riding Report, which had to be published with a paper from the board prefixed to every copy of the report. That was the background to the launch of the Farmer's Magazine in 1800, edited by Robert Brown, which avoided the attempt by the board and its secretary to exercise administrative control. The three surveyors had questioned why the practice of husbandry in the Yorkshire area was not what could have been respected. Their views are summed up in these words. This is a pretty lesson to Sir John Sinclair. He may toil and scheme and plan as long as he lives at the head of the Board of Agriculture, but it will go all for nothing as long as gentlemen persevere in these methods of letting land. The readers of Brown's journals would also have the chance to learn about the contribution of John Coburn of Ormiston, the Lord Justice Clerk, whose father had made the first attempt to introduce a new system of long leases. His tenant then commenced to enclose his fields. He was Andrew White, a cousin of Robert Brown's grandmother who later travelled around Scotland reporting on farming practices for the commissioners of the forfeited estate between 1778 and 1784. But there was a much earlier hidden history linked to successful agricultural reform. Part of it is revealed in the obituary of George Buck and Hibbon, when it refers to him spending most of his younger days with his grandfather at Long Nidri, a place where husbandry was studiously exercised. It adds, in short, he not only farmed well, but he also farmed with profit. Circumstances too often overlooked by landed gentlemen when any considerable part of their estate is taken under their own management. End of part one.